It all starts with a vision, the foresight to see the possibilities ahead, and the brilliant ingenuity to bring it to life, and the skill to make the impossible possible. It is understanding your role and using it to shape the way forward. It is to recognize the freedom of creativity. It's having the ability to be bold, yet stay relevant through the years by creating forms that are meaningful and lasting. Built to beautify your life. Built for you to thrive. It is this spirit of perfection and wanting better that fuels our purpose at Nations Trust Bank. A philosophy that drives us to be more than a bank and recognize our ability to shape lives present and future by building relationships that endure. Shaped the right way. Shaped for better. Nations Trust Bank. Uh, over to you, Anya. Expect a, yeah. Hello. Um, okay, so I haven't spoken in a while because I've been trying to write my thesis. Um, and I say um a lot because I haven't spoken a lot. Uh, so I have been asked to ask you guys if I say um for someone to just shout um back at me so that I stop saying um. Just, <laughs> just to let you guys know that. So before I start, just out of curiosity, can anyone guess how many small wild cats, sorry, how many cats there are, um, how many species of cats there are in the world? I'm going to shout out numbers. Raise your hand if you think that's the correct number, right? 12 species. No, 41, 25, 25, 10, I was just shy, what's happening here, okay, okay. <laughs> last time, 30, it's a cat species, okay, 30, okay, we have two brave souls, the correct answer is 41, right, so that's anyone who just said yes, if you all didn't put your hands up, I'm going to take that as a null and void answer. Um, so there are 41 species of cat felines, right? Out of these 41, how many are big cats? Is it um, 10? 5, 6, 7, 8, 8? Okay, 8, who says 8? 8, 10? 10, 12. 12, 30, no, 40, okay, correct number, seven, so you're the closest, well done, can you all name a couple of them, cheetah, I lost count, <laughs> okay, okay, I'm just going to go because my math sucks. Okay, so here we go. Here you've got your seven big cats, right? You've got the tiger, the lion, the jaguar, the puma or mountain lion, um, leopard, snow leopard, and the cheetah. So fun fact though, the mountain lion and the cheetah are actually considered small cats, even though they are over the normal weight class, which is over 20 kg. Right, And the reason they're classified as small cats is because they have a hyoid bone. And that's the bone that allows them to purr. <laughs> that's the one that allows them to purr. Right? So big cats can't purr, small cats can purr. So anyone who has kitty cats at home, you all hear them purring. So that's what most small cats do, including these two. But because they are heavier than the typical small cat, we lump them in with the big cats. So that leaves, who's good at math? How many small cats do we have now? 41 minus 7. Someone said something. 34, 34 correct, yay. Okay. 
Can you all name five small cats? Anyone? Okay. 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 Also a lot. Okay. Without minusing the three that we've got here, can you all name three more? Sorry? Leopard cat. Leopard cat. Okay. Jagrandi. Yeah. Okay. Good. So here you go. Right? So these are just the species. I haven't even gone into subspecies. If we go into the subspecies of small cat, it'll jump, uh, it'll jump, I think, it'll jump a lot. So, this, so because of that, I'm sorry to all the big cat people, but there's a bit of debate because there are, so there's a turf wars and a big cat versus a small cat. So we, we win this battle because there are way more small cats than there are big cats. So Sri Lanka has four cat species. Four small cat species, five if you consider the, le the leopard, right? So we've got jungle cat, we've got fishing cat, we've got the domestic cat, and we've got the rusty. But for today's lecture, I'm going to concentrate on the three small wild cats and chuck the domestic cat out the door for this lecture. And we shall move on. So fishing cat. By the way, I haven't said um as yet, so I'm very proud of myself. Um, oh. <laughs> Spoke too soon. Okay, so, so fishing cats, right? So fishing cats is a species that I work on, and I work on the population that is found in Colombo. They are the only po urban population of fishing cats within the species range, and that range is up here. So you can see it's very limited. Sri Lanka has the best distribution in terms of country versus population distribution. In India, they are concentrated just along the north, south, eastern, eastern coast. And in Bangladesh, they're found fairly everywhere. But like in places like Cambodia and even Nepal, you don't find them much because of the habitat and poaching and all those fun stuff. Historically, the population did exist in Vietnam and Indonesia, but since the 2000s, we haven't had any confirmed sightings of wild individuals in these countries. So we are kind of sadly declaring them as extinct in those countries until we get more um, camera trap um, or photo evidence of live um, individuals. Said them again, sorry about that. Okay, general facts. So the conservation status of this species, according to IUC and Red List, is vulnerable, and that's based on the 2016. Uh, I'm trying not to say um, <clears throat> based on the 2016 report. National Red List, they're endangered, and under the FFPO, they are fully protected species. So that means you cannot have them as pets. You can't touch them. You can't go anywhere near them, and that goes for us as well as researchers. We can't lay our hands on any fishing cat that we see without wildlife department representatives um, in the vicinity. Their local names are Handundivia in Singhala and in Tamil, Neenpiti Pune or Kodukulli. I'm sorry if I butchered that. I've tried really hard to pronounce it better. Um, then in terms of weight, kittens are 170 grams at birth. So that's lighter than a bar of Candos chocolate. So that's pretty tiny. Adults are 10 to 16 kilos and adult females, sorry, that's adult males. Adult females are five to eight kilos. So I tried to bring my dog here because he's exactly 16 kg, but BMICH didn't let me, but he would have been a great prop for this. Adult height, 13 inches, and that's about the average height of a street dog or your pet dog if it's a Sri Lankan um, local local puppy. They are often mistaken for leopard cubs, and that's because of their coloration and their spot patterns. But there are subtle differences. Can anyone name two? Anyone? Yeah, so fishing cats would have solid black um, spot patterns. Leopards have the rosettes, anything else, it's kind of very obvious. The stripes around the neck, 
Yes, so fishing caps are very muscular, but there's something really obvious. Yes, so fishing cats have really short, funny, stumpy little tails, whereas this leopard has this magnificently long tail that they use to balance when they're climbing trees. So fishing cats don't climb trees, so they don't need that long, flowy tail. So that's why it looks kind of sad um, and funny looking. They are primarily a nocturnal species, and that's what literature tells us. But based on camera trap evidence and GPS collar movement data, we can say that fishing cats are actually an opportunistic species, meaning that they will move around whenever they feel like it. They're not 100% committed to waking up in the night when all of us go to bed. So if they're hungry during the day, they will move around seeking food. They are also known as habitat specialists. That means that they need a particular habitat in order to survive. And those habitats are wetlands or mangroves and other water rich um, areas. And that's why we have such a good distribution in Sri Lanka is because we've got so many waterways and tanks and lakes around the country and most of these areas or most of these tanks and lakes and rivers have water within them continuously. So because of that, it allows these species to persist in areas that say in areas that are similar to say in India, where during the drought, the water completely evaporates and the cats aren't able to survive. So we have that, you know, that little sweet spot where our water doesn't completely um, kind of evaporate during dry seasons. We've always got something there for these cats. So as their name suggests, fishing cats are really, really good at catching fish. And they're such patient hunters. They will often sit for hours along the bank waiting for that perfect fish to swim by. And when it does, this is what it does. This is how they basically catch the fish. So they'll dive underwater or they submerge their upper body in the water to grab fish. And when they do that, they'll close their eyes a bit. So they're squinting underwater. They'll also flatten their ears back against their skull so that water doesn't go into their ear canal. And another thing, if you notice in this guy or girl, I think she's a, it's, yes, it's female. Another thing you notice in her is that when she goes underwater and she comes back out, her fur is dry. So it's be, that's because they have a double layered coat. And the double layer coat allows their skin to not get wet when they're submerged. It's kind of like a polar bear in that sense. Does anyone want to watch that again? Yeah, okay. So just make note of the fur and how the water is just kind of trickling off it without the fur getting wet. Also, you might notice her whiskers, she points them forward. And the reason she does that is because the whiskers are picking up vibrations on the water surface. So another thing is based on current data that's been coming in, Fishing cats, their main diet does, isn't necessarily fish, even though they're named fishing cat. They will actually eat birds and mammals a bit more than they do fish. And that's because it's always easier to catch a bird or a mammal versus, you know, sitting at the river bank waiting for your fish to swim past. Anyone heard a fishing cat? You all know what it may sound like? No? Okay. So this is a happy, a happy chuckle, as we call it. This is done as when they're in a good mood, when they're communicating with one another, they make this sound. It's a weird sound coming from a rather muscular cat. You all want to listen to that again? Okay.
So if you all walk along the wetlands dead at night, say 12, 12 a.m. onwards, you probably hear this sound. So this here is another uh, type of vocalization. So this female is in heat and this is the sound she makes to attract boys. Want to listen to that again? Yes, no? Yeah? So that's also a sound that anyone who has domestic cats, they will make this sound if you leave the house, for example. Like my mother's cat makes this sound all the time when she leaves. He walks around with his toy and he makes this noise or something similar to this. So it's a way of communicating distress or sadness or frustration. So moving on to the jungle cat. Jungle cat has three subspecies and the subspecies we have here are called Fe uh, Felis Chaus Finis or Kelati, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And this subspecies was declared in 2017 by the IUCN cat specialist group. So jungle cats, this range map that I've shown includes all three subspecies. So they are pretty much found throughout the globe, right? Most of the, um, most countries. And because of that, they're called the jackal of the cat family because they're so common. The subspecies we have a finis is found in Afghanistan, Pakistan, here at home, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, and Bhutan. General facts, um, least concern according to IUCN Red List, nationally uh, near threatened, and again, fully protected under FFPO. In Singhala, they're known as Balbalala, and in Tamil, they're known as Katupune. Weight, kittens at birth are 43 to 55 grams, which is the weight of an egg, a large egg. So check out an egg when you go home. Adults are five to nine kilos. And again, like the fishing cat, they're about the size of a Sri Lankan dog, maybe about an inch taller. They're active during the day and night, and they're most commonly seen walking along roads and dirt parts, or even the paddy field the nearer. Um, at dusk or dawn. And unlike the fishing cat, which has a very literal name, jungle cats don't really spend time in the jungle because most of us, when we think jungle, we're thinking like a thick, lush, rainforesty type area. These cats are actually found more in shrubland and in grasslands and in wetlands. So the name is a bit misleading. Studies in India have found that Jungle cats are closely associated with water, like fishing cats. And this is probably why they are also found in agricultural lands and human dominated areas. And these landscapes not only have a lot of water because they're constantly being irrigated, but they also are chock full of prey species. So birds, rodents, rats, uh, small mammals, things like that, which um, are plentiful for the jungle cat and also less predators because it is a human dominated area. So there's not going to be a lot of leopards walking around or jackal or anything that will possibly uh, get at these guys. So Dr. Mithapala's study and the other study done by Jayasekara showed very similar results where jungle cats are seen in dry and intermediate zones and they are also found close to reservoirs or within five kilometers of riverine habitats. I hope I got that correct. She's here, so I'm like very nervous here. Uh, so, and like in India, in Sri Lanka, we have jungle cats close to paddy fields and agricultural landscapes for the same reason. In terms of hunting, unlike the fishing cat that dives into the water, jungle cats have a really nifty talent of doing a high jump. And they, before they jump, what they do is they'll sit like that cat in the photograph or in the video. They'll point their ears slightly down and they've got these long tufts of fur on the tips of their ears. And these hairs pick up 
minute vibrations. When they locate a rat or some kind of prey species in the grass, they will pounce like this. I apologize for the music. I did not put the music in this video. So that's how they pounce on prey. They do this surprise kamikaze kind of aerial attack. And their coat makes them blend seamlessly into the background. They've got this uniform colored coat and it helps them not only kind of blend into the background in terms of hiding from prey and so that they can sneak up on prey, but it also allows them to avoid predation because you know they, they are kind of broken up and really camouflage with their surroundings. Another interesting thing about jungle cats is they are the only, sorry, they are one of the 11 species of wild cats that are melanistic. So you'll get them in a solid black color. Um, and these 11 uh, wild cats will be the big cats and some small cats. So that's pretty cool. Moving on to the Rusty. So I work on fishing cats, but Rusties are my all time favorite cats. They are incredible. They are found only in Nepal, India, and Sri Lanka. So very, very unique species. In terms of general um, facts, they are near threatened according to the IUCN red list. Nationally, they're endangered and fully protected under FFPO. They're known as Koladivia in Singhala and in Tamil, oh God. Turumpam, Turumpam Pune, I'm sorry, yeah, that, oh God. And um, yeah, so kittens at birth, again, 60 to 70 grams, so that's the weight of an egg. Adults are 1.5, adult males are 1.5 to 2 kilos. So again, if you all have bags of flour or sugar at home, carry one of those. Adult females are 1 to 1.5, so they're really, really, really tiny cats. In terms of height, they are the size of a six month old domestic cat kitten. So they're itty bitty cats, except that they've got these really long, gorgeous tails. They are also the smallest species of cat in the world. And they are so small and so fast when they move around, they're called the hummingbirds of the cat family. Like the other cats, they are technically primarily, primarily nocturnal, but there have been sightings of them hunting during the day. So I like to say that they're more opportunistic than they are strict nocturnal or diurnal or crepuscular species. Because of their tiny size, they are often found up high up in trees when they are resting and that's to avoid predation. And also kind of avoid prying eyes. When they are active, they will climb back down and they'll go about their business, hunting, marking territory, just doing their normal rounds. Main prey are rodents, small birds and small mammals, frogs, small reptiles, and on and off they will eat insects. When they're living close to human habitation, they do prey on poultry, so your chickens and ducks and things like that. There's very little known about the species here in Sri Lanka in terms of their distribution and anything else really. Um, and even though we don't really know about their distribution, they have been seen in all climatic zones, but they do prefer dense forest and they are found in Colombo wetlands as well and other closed canopy habitats. They're also frequently seen in submontane tea plantation. So I'm sure all of you all have seen in the news, rusty kittens being picked up, often mistaken for leopard, uh, leopard cubs as well. So now we're moving on to the ecological importance of small wildcats. Why do we need to have them around? So I've just pulled down about four really important ones. Is that four? Yes, four. So they do top down control of the trophic levels. So that's basically they regulate prey species, so small birds, small mammals, insects, things like that. And this prevents overpopulation or overabundance of a certain species. So if you, for example, take a rusty out of, or rather, if you take the cats out of the equation, you're gonna have a boom in your 
rodent populations. And we're seeing that a lot with the peacocks that are around, right? We've got peacocks in places where we normally don't get peacocks. And yes, it could be because the, you know, it's getting a little warmer and the habitat's getting better for these species, but you also don't have their predators. You don't have leopards running around. You don't have jackals running around. So these prey species are just kind of booming and now governments is telling us to shoot them. So you've kind of tipped the balance here. So it's the same with the small cats. You also, they are also an indicator species. So that means you can measure ecosystem health. So if you remove them from an ecosystem, you could, what have I written here? Okay, sorry, no. Their presence and their abundance and even their decline can tell you how a habitat's doing. So for example, let's take the fishing cat, right? In Colombo, you've got the wetlands. The fishing cats are very, very, uh, they need wetlands in order to survive water rich habitats. So there's one in 2016 of 17, we noticed that the Diyasaru Park had no fishing cats. And this is a park that had about six cats just walking everywhere every night. Then suddenly our cameras had zero cats walking around and it kind of carried on for a couple of weeks and Maduranga and I were wondering, okay, what's happening? It's weird. So then we decided let's take a look at the habitat. What has changed? So what we noticed was a lot of the ground vegetation and the bank vegetation along the waterways were being cut, cut to a point where it was really low turf, right? And another thing we noticed was there was scum on the water that had come from a garage downstream that had emptied their tank or something into the waterways. So there was this oily substance floating in the water and another thing was that there was a lot of water hyacinth. So all these factors contributed to an uninhabitable space for fishing cats. So when you lose your indicator species, you kind of get an understanding of what's happening in the surrounding areas as well. Then they are indirect seed disper dispersal units. As in, um, for example, if a jungle cat eats a rat and that rat has eaten the seeds of some plant, the cat will often, if the prey is small enough, they will swallow gut contents and then the cat will go along his merry way and then nature calls and he'll kind of poop it all out. And then you've got all these little seeds that don't digest in the digestive system landing in a completely different area and that helps to contribute in plant dispersal and colonization and it also brings about really nice plant diversity within various habitats and ecosystems. Another thing that these cats do is their natural uh, pest control units. They are really beneficial for farmers and also us who live in urban spaces in terms of um, controlling rodent populations and other populations of unwanted pests. So for example, jungle cats have been known to roughly consume around 1,500 rodents a year. So that's a lot of pest control that that one cat is doing. So imagine if you've got like a bunch kind of roaming around your paddy fields, the you needing to use pesticides, rodenticides and things like that um, will be drastically reduced. So threats. There are several threats that um, affect our small cats, including the big cats and other wildlife. So a couple are urbanization, roadkill, deforestation, pollution, pet illnesses, rescuing kittens, poaching, and of course, shrimp farming. So I'm just gonna talk about a couple here. Urbanization, everyone knows, um, cities are growing, towns are growing, small, uh, large urban capital cities are growing. We can't stop it, but what we can do is we can do it in mitigate it and do it sustainably. But these types of development are hurting our wildlife and our wild cats. Roadkill is a big problem. We've got a lot of roadkill reports coming in. Pet illnesses. Who has domestic cats? Can you all raise your hands? Okay. How many of these domestic cats are indoor cats 24-7? Yay, two. 
Oh, four, nice, five. Okay, so everyone else who raised their hands who have outdoor cats, it's a bit of a pet peeve, but I'm not gonna go on a rant. But basically your indoor cats, how many of these cats are vaccinated? Is that everyone? Okay, at least they're vaccinated. So keep your cats vaccinated if you can't keep them inside at least. Because uh, like I have seen fishing cat kittens and rusty kittens and jungle cat kittens that or even older animals that have got parvovirus and they're dead within 12 to 24 hours. And the death is terrible to watch. They basically drown in their own blood in most cases. It's horrible. So if you can't keep your cats indoors, at least have keep them vaccinated in order to protect your wild cats and your other um, urban or whatever wildlife. Rescuing kittens. So a lot of people, this happens during monsoon season mostly or harvesting season or any season if it's like um, in a tea estate is where you come across kittens and out of the goodness of your heart, you pick them up thinking that the mother has abandoned them. In most cases, a mother is kind of way back in the distance watching because she's too afraid to come and take the kitten because in her mind, yes, it's a kitten, it's, it's terrible that you know it's being eaten by a potential predator, but at the same time, she has to preserve her own life. So what people will do is they'll bring these kittens out of the you know, their little nest or their den, they'll call wildlife department to come and pick them up, or they'll keep them as pets. And then, you know, the, these kittens are really cute and cuddly for the first six months, like any baby animal, they're adorable. But then the moment those hormones start raging, you've got like a little demon in your house, right? They're peeing everywhere, they're biting people, it's, it's horrible. And I have come across cats that have been returned to the wildlife department because the people can't look after them anymore. So if you see kittens, watch them from a distance, make sure that predators don't come and, you know, tackle them or eat them or whatever, because a mother will come and take them. And in Colombo, our wetlands, uh, during monsoon, fishing cats will move their kittens to higher ground. And higher ground means closer to us. So if you see kittens, just leave them alone. Again, watch them from a distance to make sure the mother comes and takes them. If you really do think that they've been abandoned or the mother has been killed or something, then call the wildlife department and they will come and uh, remove them. If wildlife department can't come, you can always drop us a message. But don't drop us a message on Facebook because I don't check Facebook. So WhatsApp me or email me or something. Um, then we have pollution. So, so pollution is basically your typical um, pesticides and your rodenticides and things like that. But what we did find is, oh no. Ah, okay, right. So what we did find was plastic in fishing cat scat, so fishing cat poop. And that basically is showing us that plastic is moving up the trophic chain and it's affecting larger predators um, as latest research shows that this also affecting us. Um, so in terms of this study, we found that there was microplastic, meso and macroplastics in fishing cat scat. And all three plastics were found in prey in scats that contain rodents, birds, and fish. So yeah, that's, it's a bit worrying um, to know that plastic is also um, you know, affecting our cats. So research. There are several different research methods that us biologists kind of use in order to spy on our animals um, and on whatever our target species are. And in order to use these techniques, we have to have you know, a research question or something like that. So before I get on to the types of technology we use, here's just an example of past research that's been done on all three small cats in Sri Lanka since the early 1990s. 
And there's another slide here. So that's, that's uh, 27 studies that have been done from the 1990s to 2023. And what's really kind of shocking is that between 1901, so yeah, sorry, 1901 and 1935, sorry, there's a typo up there. Between 1901 and 1935, there's a 34 year gap between anyone studying cats, small cats. And then between 35 and 56, 21 years, there's another big break. Um, and then again, 56 to 2003, 47 years, and then 2003 to 2012, 2012, yeah, that's nine years. So it kind of sounds like me trying to write my thesis where I just disappear for like an X number of months, um, where I don't look at my thesis. So that's what these big gaps kind of remind me of, um, but it's kind of, worrying and weird that no one was really interested in um, kind of studying these animals. And it's sad, you know, because they're like, they're very, very cool animals. So then after 2022, we have an uptick in our research. There are 10 ongoing studies um, on small cats right now that are currently happening. Um, and those are, those range from um, you know, just the, the effects of conservation education on species survival, ecology and home rangers, scat analysis, presence, abundance, and human and uh, small cat interactions or conflicts. So it's very promising to see that more and more people are getting interested in studying these cats. If anyone knows of any other people working on small cats, please just let us know so that we can update this table. So moving on to research technology that's currently in use. I have listed what my team and I uh, use both at Urban Fishing Care and also at in our organization. So we use camera traps, wildlife collars and tags. We use scopes and we dabble in a bit of microscopy. In terms of camera trapping, this is the most non-invasive way of observing our target species. Why doesn't this like me? So disconnect. Okay. Yay. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is the best way of looking at our animals without actually bothering our animals. And we can look at all sorts of behavior using camera traps. So the cameras that we use are either IR or infrared flash or white flash. I, I mean, white flash is really cool because you get color, but I don't particularly, particularly like using white flash in urban settings because it does attract people. And that's just a recipe for disaster. So we tend to veer towards um, IR cameras, which are black and white, and nobody really sees them unless they're really, really looking. So here's just an example of animals that we have got within Colombo's urban spaces on our cameras. So the top left, top left, you've got a water monitor, I don't know if it's very clear. Then you've got your purple heron. Then anyone who visits the Asaru Park, that's Chutidua, the cow, she's very sweet. She likes Mari biscuits and bananas, if anyone's interested. Then we've got um, animal, domestic animal wildlife conflict. So that's a feral dog or rather one of the golf club dogs um, attacking a porcupine. Then we've got a flock of purple chickens or purple swamp pens. I like to call them chickens because they remind me of chickens. Then we've got a family of purple um, leaf monkeys. So you've got the, what I like to say, it kind of reminds me of my mother, my brother and I, like my mom's just sitting on the fence, just like, God, what's happening? Why am I like a part of this? Marley and I are fighting. I'm pulling his hair. He's crying for me to help him. That's pretty much my life growing up. Then uh, we've got the saltwater crocodile. Um, this particular croc was pretty large. Then we've got our fishing cat, 
during the day walking along the Diyasaru walkway and um, a purple heron just taking a selfie because why not? Um, so in terms of cats, right? Small cats are really small, right? They've got a lot of things to worry about. They've got people to worry about. They've got natural predators to worry about. So at Diyasaru Park, we have been camera trapping there since 2015, just kind of monitoring the population of fishing cats there. And in 2021, we got our first photograph of a rusty spotted cat. So that was like a six year wait before this little lady graced our cameras. So that is how difficult, difficult it is working on these cats and capturing these cats. So when somebody says, what's the population of a fishing cat or a jungle cat or a rusty in this country? I'm like, look, we can't even get a proper elephant count. How am I supposed to tell you how many rusty spotted cats there are? They're like the size of a tiny little kitty running around, you know? So it's impossible to know, right? But the fact that their inner habitat is good news. And that's all I need to know because I know that they're there. I will work on protecting the habitat so that they will continue being there. So wildlife collars, my favorite. These are super, super, super cool. So the camera trap will let you visually see animals in the area, interactions, fun things like that. Wildlife collars let me know exactly where my cats are going. I can literally follow their footsteps as they walk through Colombo. And it is the most exciting thing, not just because I, we get to capture them and see them in our cages and then you know handle them and put the collar on them and name them, but you know, we really get an insight into their lives. So tags, um, so these, so there's collars and then there are tags. Tags are like tiny little, teeny weeny little like tags, like basically what the word means, it's a tag. And these can be as small as a paper clip where you can put it on a little bird or a bee, for example, or they can be as big as a laptop which you can slap onto very gently onto one of Asha's blue whales, right? So they kind of range in size. So here is an example of two collars. You've got the rusty collar on your left. Oh, my left, yeah, left. And you've got a fishing cat collar on your right. The rusty, uh, rusty collar is a radio collar or a VHF collar, so that's manually, so you put the collar on the cat and then you have to manually follow the cat for days. And that would be me going in one direction, Maduranga going from another direction, and then Dr. Mittapala going from another direction, right? And then all of us call each other and we're like, okay, fine. The, the beep from the collar is in this direction and we all draw lines on a map and where those lines converge is where the animal is. It's a pain in the butt. It's fun for a while, but then you just like hate your life because it's tiring. There's a lot of room for error and it's just, it's just, it's, it's like, it's, it's annoying basically, right? So I like using GPS collars because I know that there's going to be accurate data or as accurate as it possibly can be being collected by the collar and all I need to do is find the animal and download the data. Unfortunately, GPS collars means there needs to be a bigger battery and the collars need to be heavier. So for Rusty's, we have no choice but to use radio collars. Um, and for my project, we use kind of like a hybrid. It's a GPS, oh, sorry. This is a GPS GSM collar. So it collects GPS data and then at the end of every day, I get an SMS. And then that SMS is translated onto my computer and then I know where my cat goes. I don't need to leave the house. So it's, it's for the lazy biologist, but it's still fun, right? So what we do, what we have are GPS collars. So what, I, what happens is we attach that collar that's under the antenna with the leather strap onto our cat, then we release it, then using that antenna and that big gray box that's called a base station, we go looking for our cat. One person goes looking, we don't need three people. And then the moment I hear the collar, and the sound is kind of like a coin falling on a metal surface. It's like a ping, but we call it a ping, it's very original. So when we, when we hear the ping, we know that the cat is close by. We turn the base station on and all the data downloads onto it, onto a little SD card, put it in the computer, and then we, we know exactly where our, where our collars, sorry, where our cats have gone. 
the downside of this is the collar is $1,500, the base station is $1,500. So it's a very expensive, expensive thing to do collaring cats. So here's one of our females. She was collared in 2018. That's just me putting the, uh, the collar on her while Chintaka, the wildlife department handler on our project, he's taking measurements for us. So we take all measurements, height, weight, we record any wounds on them, teeth wear and tear, things like that, just to have it on record in case, you know, in case she gets hit by a car, we're able to identify her. So here's her movement data. I'm not sure how clear it is, but this is two weeks of data. And, our, and her collar was programmed to take a GPS point every 10 minutes. So we could literally walk her path. And there was a point where she had kittens and we found her den. We saw that she had made like this little den in these reeds and she had flattened the inside of it and it was like really cute and cozy. So we found her, we found three dens where she moved the kittens during the rainy season all towards higher ground. So at first, her first den was in a paddy field which flooded. She moved it to the Asaru Park and then the island that the second den was on flooded and then she moved it to higher ground closer to the areas where people walk. So we get really, really cool um, data. We also are able to identify ways cats move from one place to another within urban settings, screen spaces, people's houses, places where these cats find safe enough to cross and live within the city. So it's really, so you, so GPS collars are just amazing and awesome. They're just really expensive. So the other thing we do is we use scopes. We use thermal scopes. Um, using thermal scopes in an economic um, calamity is a bit difficult because we can't find good batteries that last long. Um, but Basically, the reason we use thermal versus night vision or just using our eyesight during the day is uh, pretty clear here. Night vision, it's kind of iffy, but with the thermal, it just cuts right through and you get um, to see what you're looking for. So thermal scopes are really cool, um, but again, very expensive. So, and the batteries right now are not that great. Then we've got microscopy, which is a bit new for our team because we're mainly field biologists, not really lab biologists, but it was fun for us. So the reason we used microscopy is because we wanted to identify fishing cat prey. What are they eating in the urban spaces? So in order to find that out, we had to look for poop. And poop for a biologist is like the most exciting thing on the planet. I think I get more excited seeing poop than I actually do when I see my cats. It's just incredible. So these are just examples of what um, prey species hair looks like under the microscope. And each prey species has a different hair structure. So it's kind of like a fingerprint. So if you can match hairs, it, it, so for example, the hair on the top middle top row um, would belong to say a bandicoot. That particular hair structure will not be seen in any other animal. So it's basically your um, fingerprint so you can identify species. So conservation measures. Um, how can we protect these cats? Not just as biologists, but just as you know, citizens. Um, we can work on habitat protection and restoration. And habitat protection and restoration doesn't necessarily have to be something that the government does. You know, you and I can do this from the comfort of our homes. Um, we all, I'm assuming everyone here is based in Colombo to some extent. And I assume that everyone has some sort of garden, or even if you are living in like an apartment, you all will have like a little balcony, right? So in order to um, kind of create habitat or restore habitat for urban wildlife. And in terms of urban wildlife, FYI, Colombo has 252 species of wildlife, right? So that's a lot for a city. So the way you can preserve habitat or restore habitat for these animals, not just for the cats, but also for bees and birds and butterflies and things like that. If you've got a garden and you have a nice manicured lawn, what you could maybe do is have a little section at the back that's overgrown. 
you know, just so that it provides some sort of safety for wildlife. Or you've got leaf litter there, don't sweep the leaves. Um, let the leaves kind of rot and mulch away. If there are fruit that fall, you can throw it there because there's apparently a species of butterfly that only feeds on rotting fruit. So there are all these little micro little things that you could do in order to preserve habitat for wildlife, whether it's urban or um, outside urban spaces. Then you can reduce human wildlife conflict and promote coexistence. So that would be um, in terms of you know, just citizens and again, not government. What you could do is if you've got neighbors who are having problems with some animal that's, you know, eating their fish or if they've got like small scale poultry, like my mother has a problem with her carp, the pond heron comes and eats all her carp and she gets really mad. But when the when I see it happening, I don't tell her. So things like that, you know, you can just kind of pretend it doesn't happen or you can help them find ways to protect their animals. So if it's if it's um, small scale poultry, maybe you can and it's a low income family. Maybe you can help them build a more secure chicken pen, you know, because then their chickens or their poultry are safe and then they're not going to be inclined to kill your, um, you know, fishing cats or jungle cat or whatever has been predating on these, um, on their livestock. Then you have um, anti-poaching efforts. So again, you don't need to be government in order to work on anti-poaching. If you, everyone has social media, right? Yeah, who has social media, raise your hands. Everyone, awesome, okay. I mean, not awesome, it's horrible, but anyway. Um, so in terms of social media, when you're scrolling through Facebook and just kind of going through, you know, the typical drill and you see somebody with a post of, oh, here's my pet um, palm civet, or here's a little fishing cat that I found, or here's something else. Or if somebody shares, oh, look at these cute little otters that are pets. You know, don't look at them and don't give those views because the more views that are given, the more it's promoted as illegal pets, you know. And if you see someone in Sri Lanka that has an illegal pet, report it. You know, um, you can report it to wildlife department or report it to the nearest law enforcement. I know everyone's going to roll their eyes and say, oh my God, wildlife department, they're gonna, not going to do anything, but they actually do, right? If you call them and give them the proper information, in most cases they do. And even if you think that they won't, at least you have done your part, right? Instead of just rolling your eyes and not doing it, at least you made the call and you reported something. So think about it that way. Then you've got research and monitoring. Research and monitoring for a lot of people. Um, uh, I don't mean, I, I, please don't shoot me, but to a lot of biologists and a lot of people, around the world, research means collecting all the data you can and publishing your paper and then dust your hands and move on to the next uh, fun thing. But if you really want to protect your species, what you found through that research, implement it. If you don't have time to do it, train someone else to work on the conservation, um, you know, the conservation uh, strategies that you have mentioned. All of us have mentioned how to protect a species or how to implement what we have found in our papers. That's like a requirement in most journals. Um, so instead of us saying, oh, you know, someone has to do X, Y, and Z based on what we have found, why can't we put in a bit of time to train that someone to do X, Y, and Z? So that we know that, yes, it will be carried on or at least somebody will try to carry on carry it on. So that's research and monitoring. I hope I don't get scolded for that. Anyway, um, then policy advocacy means you advocate for your species. So um, a really nice example was when, um, you know, the government was going to do the big highway through Talangama. One of the things that was brought up was it's a wildlife, it's not just, not, not only is it like a protected area and it's a Ramsar wetland, but it's also an area for wildlife. There were fishing cats, the jackals were mentioned, all these species were mentioned. So that is advocating for your species and bringing them into, you know, um, the limelight when you're trying to stop things or, you know, when you're trying to bring in legislation, you're including these species into it. Sorry if I don't make sense there, I apologize. 
Um, then collaborative conservation, which is another big thing, where people, instead of kind of doing what our animals do, marking territory, everyone work together, because at the end of the day, we're all trying to you know, protect the same species in the same habitat. I know living in the perfect world, everyone would be like kumbaya and working together, but that's not how it is in the real world. But at the same time, we need to try and work in unison, whether you're different research organizations or whether you're different government uh, bodies or non-government bodies or private sector, whatever, you know, work together and collaborate in order to get to the next step. Then community-based conservation. So in terms of this, it's really, really important because we can't protect wildlife without our communities because our communities are the ones who live alongside wildlife. So us coming and just giving a lecture and talking about protecting this and that, if you all aren't interested in protecting this and that, this and that's not going to get protected. So we need to involve our communities in our conservation efforts. And I'm just kind of gonna go through how we do it, um, just as an, exa as an example, because I'm not, I mean, I know what other people are doing, but I don't wanna speak on their behalf. So what we do is we try and do, we try and involve kids a lot, because kids are the ones who are gonna annoy their parents to do X, Y, and Z. So last year we started a young wildlife biology course, starter course, which gave kids between the ages of 10 to 16 a chance to find out what it's like being a biologist. So they had throughout the year 12 sessions on different topics um, that were related to urban wetlands and urban wildlife. They had assignments and little exams that they had to do. And this was done in collaboration with the FEO. Some of the topics that we went through were, you know, the importance of urban wetlands, fishing cats, um, Colombo's bird life, um, wildlife tracks and scats, how to identify animals looking at poop and footprints. And after each session, so there was a small lecture and then the kids had a little uh, field activity. After each session, they had to present do like a quick five minute presentation on what they learned, just to kind of get their public speaking skills um, polished up. And at the end of the final session, they had an overnight camp in one of the wetlands, it rained like crazy, the tents got wet, the, the marshmallows got wet, the fire kind of fizzled out, but they had a great time. And then they had to do a small poster presentation for all the stakeholders and they were given like a little certificate saying that they completed this course. But it was just basically a way for them to get immersed into wildlife biology, um, kind of like a, an opportunity that we didn't get when we were that age. Then we do lots of awareness programs and this is really important because for example, when I started working on fishing cats in Colombo in 2013, nobody knew what a fishing cat was. Nobody even believed me when I said that there were fishing cats in Colombo wetlands. And then, you know, we spent years, Madurang and I spent years doing awareness, whether it was through social media or just talking to people while we walked down roads. And now so many people are talking about fishing cats. So many people are visiting our urban wetlands looking for fishing cats. So that is the power of awareness and educating people on a particular species, getting that, um, what do you call it? that taboo of these are scary animals that will kill our children while they walk to school or they'll eat my dog or they'll do this and that to us. You're kind of eliminating that and helping them appreciate these species and their habitats. Then our team has also started urban wetland walks and nocturnal fishing cat prowls. So the urban wetland walks is a chance for the general public to join our team on a walk twice a month, where we teach you all about the habitats, teach you all about the, um, you know, the species that we come across during the walks and the nocturnal fishing cat prowls, same thing, but it's done in the night. Hopefully we find a fishing cat or we even hear a fishing cat, but you know, that's all depends on the cat. And during these things, we teach them um, how, the, uh, we teach them again, how to identify scat and tracks. We teach them how to set up cameras and how to use cameras and work cameras. If I am with them, I bring my collars along with, um, with me so that, 
you know, they get a chance to hear the ping and track the animals with the collars, but because the collars are so expensive, I don't really let them out of my sight. Another thing we do is we take on interns, and again, that's just to give kids an, um, you know, um, give kids an opportunity to learn and work with us. And during these, one of the most important, the first thing I do with my interns is I teach them how to do public speaking. Hopefully, they don't say um as much as I do, but you know, one can hope. Um, and then I teach them how to make presentations so that they are interesting and not the typical types of presentations that we're all exposed to in school. No offense to school. Another thing we do is urban invasive species removal programs, and that we do at various wetlands. We help the wetlands manage their invasive hyacinth and salvinia bursts when they happen. And for that also, we have volunteer calls and we give people an experience that they normally wouldn't um, be able to experience. Of course, it depends on the wetland because some wetlands have salties and safety first. We don't want people kind of getting eaten. So if there aren't crocs or rather low numbers of crocs, we allow people to come and um, help us clean the waterways. Then we've got social surveys and these are done to determine the levels of human wildlife conflict or interactions. And for these, we take our interns and volunteers with us to talk to locals living around wetlands to just get an understanding of their outlook on these species and the habitats. Because as a lot of these urban wetlands are being reclaimed by the government to be created into more secure areas and protected to some extent, a lot of these people who did encroach into the wetlands are being asked to move out. So there is a lot of anger and annoyance. So we just kind of want to understand where everyone's head's at. And in, in order to come up with a way to kind of help them or have them understand why it's important that these wetlands be returned to their former glory. And then finally, something that we have been doing since we started SCAR in 2017 is we have been collecting uh, sightings of small cats and other mammals, uh, whether it's roadkill, sightings at you know parks, in Colombo, wherever, if you see an animal, um, we've got people sending it to this very easy to remember website, save.cat. Um, and since 2017, we've got more than 300 fishing cat data points, uh, about 70 jungle cat and 40 rusty. So we're a little low on those two. But basically, this is feeds into our citizen science distribution map. And it's important to understand species distribution because we can look at their historic distribution, their current distribution. If cats are currently missing from a historic range, why are they missing? What's happened to the habitat? If they've moved back into a range that they should be in, but we haven't seen them prior until now, we want to know why there's a change. So in terms of Colombo, it's interesting because we've got cats living in the city. So areas like Timbirigasaya and Mount Lavinia and Dehivala and Marine Drive. So why, what? Is it about these places that are loving this animal, this large, well, somewhat large predatory species to live in such an urban jungle? So those are things that these data points allow us to look at because we can visit these data points, look at the environment and try and figure out what's happening. So. Yeah, that's pretty much my talk. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please ask. Here we go. Open the house for questions. Uh, just let me repeat it's questions and not statement or comments. Any specific questions you may have, yeah. Free to throw it at Anya. To what elevation do we, can we see these uh, three cats? You can see them. So we've got um, fishing cats up in the Candy Hills and up in Horton Plains as well. Rusty the same. J sorry, jungle cat. Dr. M. Not in the Highlands, not in the Highlands. But in Nepal, you've got all three cats. So that's pretty high up.
Hi, I was wondering if there's any study or any research or any evidence to say that uh, or see that the jungle cat uh, breeds with the domestic cat. Is there any evidence to that? Dr. M, do you want to answer that? Sorry. <laughs> Not in Sri Lanka, as far as I know. I don't know whether Andrew and Anjali can weigh in on this. Not in Sri Lanka, as far as I know, but we do. Uh, there is a, a breed overseas called the Chowsi, where it's deliberately bred. Jungle cat and the fishing cat are the same, um, same genus. Uh, so there is a possibility, but we, ha we, we have done so little work on these animals that we don't know. With jungle cat and fishing cat, not the same Sorry, genus, huh? cat domestic, domestic cat, cat. yeah. Domestic. Pardon me, jungle cat and domestic cat. But we have done so little. Sorry? So a few observations that I have done, uh, the locals in the area are, are highly convinced that, uh, you know, that, that certain species that we see, and they are like, you know, 100% sure, but the obvious traits of, you know, the, the black tipped uh, ears, that is not present, but everything else is very, very uh, prominent yeah, uh, in these cats that are being observed, especially in, uh, this was about a week ago in Vilpatu. Uh, I, I noticed two cats, I mean, spot on the jungle cat, but minus the, the black tips. So that's why I was wondering, but they, the locals keep saying that, yes, they are uh, mating with the uh, domestic cats. It's possible. It's possible. But without, I guess, genetics, it's difficult to say. <laughs> Uh, can you leave uh, Anya the locations of your observations, please? Thank you. You said they hide from predators. Sorry, I'm over here. Where? Uh, oh, okay. You said they. Uh, you said they hide in the daytime from the predators. Yes. From their predators. What are their predators? Oh my God! Sorry. So their predators are basically um, us, obviously. <laughs> um, and then depending on where they are, you've got the leopard, you've got jackal. Uh, you got feral dogs, so we've got lots of people calling us saying that their dogs at home have ripped a fishing cat apart. You know, so um, so anything basically a larger predatory species will uh, get a fishing cat. Pythons, crocodiles, um, yeah. and for rusties, the the list is even longer because they're so small. Um, you talked about like the threat of urbanization in terms of moving these uh, the populations about, but now that you're seeing even big cats and other predators moving into urbanized areas, like have you observed any um, difference in the population distribution based on that, like crocodiles in the Devana and as an example? Um, so in terms of cats, um, large predatory cats and even other predatory species, I'm not sure about whether fishing, fishing cats are the only, based on my literature review, there might be newer things while I was hiding from my thesis that have popped up, but based on what I have read so far, these dudes are the only ones that are living in a city, um, apart from maybe the urban coyotes in San Francisco. Um, other cat species will enter a city, like the Mumbai leopards, for example, they'll enter a city, or even the urban characters in South Africa, or the bobcats in California, or the mountain lions in Los Angeles, they'll enter a city in order to look for food or to cross, or if they're like a dispersing adult, right? But they won't kind of hunker down and camp out and you know, have their babies and interact and stuff inside urban spaces. So there's something very unique about Colombo that's happening, um, especially considering that Colombo has 252 species of wildlife in metropolitan Colombo alone. So that's a lot of animals. Like you don't need to go to Yala anymore, guys. Like just stay home and go to a wetland or just 
open your window and look out the window. Um, so, but in terms of crocodiles, we have created a really fantastic habitat for them because after the war, lots of our wetlands were cleared for flood protection or flood retention and open water is perfect for a crocodile. So they are having the best time of their lives. Um, also, prior to the wetlands being opened up, there were crocodiles, but probably not as many, if that makes sense. Yeah. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I like, we learn things from everyone. So in terms of, so I've got a team member who's starting uh, the urban crocodile project. He's going to look at how they're, you know, kind of living in the city. But basically data that he gets is important to me. He might not see a fishing cat or maybe he will, like when he's doing his night surveys, looking for his crocs, he might see a fishing cat or somebody studying like Dinal, for example, when he's doing his croc surveys in Nilwala, he sees fishing cats and he lets me know. So it's, it's good for like everyone who's doing everything. If they're like, oh, okay, this one works on this. I saw this species. I'll just let drop them an email and say, I found, I saw something or whatever they are studying at this location. It's important. Everything is important, even if it's something to do with habitat, you know? Um, so all important, all information is important for everyone. So the more you collect the somewhere down the line, it's going to come up and you'll be glad you had it. Sorry, I have another question. Um, do you have like a database because there's studies going about like on different species. Mm -hmm. Do you have like one collective database so that you can collect all the data together so that you can like cross um, not just like being in communication with one researcher, but you actually have a database you can upload it onto and therefore like um, how do I put it? Like any researcher that comes about, like they can add it to that database. The common database yeah. between all researchers. Yeah. Okay, so this is where the territoriality bit comes in because at the end of the day, we're all human. You know, we all have jobs to do. We're all getting paid or whatever to do X, Y, and Z. So the only issue with having unpublished data in a community, communal data set unless it's a project that everybody's working on, like one single project that everyone's like, oh, okay, we're starting this, who wants to join? And then all the researchers will join it. And then they're collecting data for that one particular thing. That in my mind, I think is something that everyone would be okay with. But for example, if I am collecting data for a particular thing and Dr. M is collecting data for her specific thing and it's sensitive and it's new and it's fun and someone's, I'm doing it for my PhD, she's doing it for something else. And you know, there are those sensitivities, you know, like any workplace. I think that's where having a communal database might be an issue because again, you don't know who's gonna take it and publish it because that happens. Like that happens, like people take other people's data and publish before without telling them. That's just science. It happens everywhere, not just here, like everywhere around the world. So researchers are very protective about their sensitive data. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I think just to add there, Anya, that's where we come in, where w, from WMP, we're trying to get everybody to work around the table and share the best practices. Uh, not probably sensitive data, but at yeah. least to cooperate and build up. So one of the objectives of the small cat uh, project that you started is exactly that. Yeah. Ah, yeah. I, I don't understand the problem. I mean, if, if somebody is contributing their data, they can have their name attached to it. Yeah. And it will be a copyright infringement. And what are the infringements, professional infringements, if somebody takes it and doesn't attribute it to them? That's all they need to do. It's a sensitive thing. I don't know how, how do you explain it. It's called the human ego. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. So like, that's why in terms of like, so for example, my caller data, I'm very protective of my caller data unless it's published. So even like, I will show you all GP and I know I sound like a little, you know, like a 
like a very stubborn person who doesn't want to share my toys with anyone but basically this is new information that people are getting out and not just for the scientific community but also government and you know just citizens you know so it's i will show you all a map but i'm not going to show you all the times and the exact gps location like the number you know like the little code um, but i will show you all the dots on the map but i won't tell you all anything <laughs> else until it's published i know it sounds selfish but that's just the way this game kind of works if that kind of makes sense let me respond to anjali's uh, comment that the ministry has a database we all give them the data and when we want it we have to jump through hoops and maybe six months later we get it I mean, that's been my experience i don't know about you Sorry, yeah. can I? Um, I totally respect your requirement for keeping your data because <laughs> it looks like you do a hell of a lot of work to get that in the first place. So um, I am involved in putting together an outcome-based bond for Sri Lanka, um, both on land and sea, and with the World Bank, and with a lot of international parties. And I have talked to Dr. M before on the phone. I'm the lady who works with Professor Deepthi. Um, but I would welcome the conversation. I've sent you a few messages on LinkedIn. Oh. Um, you oh. do phenomenal work. And what I want to do, because I think I've lived in Sri Lanka now 10 years, and my observation about everybody here is that everybody works in silos. So it would be brilliant if you could come along and join this activity. Okay. And we would bring in international partners who can also help support some of your research. And I think financing is always a big problem for Sri Lanka anyway. Yeah. So if we can alleviate that pressure, that would be great. Oh, that'd so. be great. So you said LinkedIn, right? My name is Lucky. Lucky. Okay. And I've sent you a message on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, several messages today okay. on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is another platform I don't reply on. So Facebook and LinkedIn, do not message me on that. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. Okay, any other questions? We probably, I think, reached our time limit. So, oh, sorry. Last one. So you all were talking about the collaboration between uh, the tourism industry and also, uh, you know, how these projects basically can benefit the tourism industry. So uh, I am involved in the tourism industry, very specially uh, with wildlife. And I just want to know your opinion on, uh, uh, you know, there are certain areas, protected areas where uh, after a certain time you cannot enter, right? Yeah. So if there was an opportunity to promote, like say certain wildlife parks, certain uh, rainforests, you know, for certain uh, activities after dark, right? And how would you all view that? Is that an uh, I think that's a discussion we can have post lecture. Yeah. Uh, what you refer to as conservation conversations, which happens after the lecture, we'll probably catch up after the lecture. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending the lecture today and mainly for Anya. Thank you so much, Anya. I know it took us uh, what, three months to prepare for this lecture. <laughs> I was hiding, Spencer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we are happy to have uh, a person who we refer to, very fondly referred to as the big cat in Sri Lanka. That's <laughs> Dr. Sriyani Mithapala. Uh, could you have you over, Dr. to please uh, give a word of uh, to give a gift to Anya? Oh, I get a, get a present. <laughs>